Ato sama sambudasa namo chasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa namo chasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa honor to him the blessed one the worthy one the fully enlightened one sadhu 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 so i'm going to take you right into the sutta tonight and we're going to read the sutta and then we're going to look at this a little bit more just ourselves okay but let's go to the um, let me get that right here because i sent this head to you and this is why um So these, basically the Buddha said there were four solaces that lead to our welfare and happiness. And according to the Buddha, there are these four comforts that are in life that will secure your welfare and happiness in life. So this is the Anguttara Nikaya, the Tika Nipata Mahavaga, Sutta number 65. On one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering on tour among the Kosalana together with a large Sangha of monks. When he reached the town of the Kalamas named Kesaputta, the Kalamas of Kesaputta heard, it is said that the ascetic Gotama, son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan has arrived at Kesaputta. Now a good report about that Master Gotama has circulated thus. The Blessed One is an Arahant, fully enlightened, endowed with knowledge and practice, sublime, knower of the worlds, a peerless tamer of men, who need to be tamed, a teacher of divine and human beings, which he by himself has through direct knowledge understood clearly. He set forth the Dhamma, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, complete in everything, claim that is perfectly pure, Seeing such consummate ones is good indeed. So then the Kalamas, the Kesaputta approached the Blessed One and some paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down to one side and some kept silent and sat down to one side. Sitting to one side, the Kalamas said to the Blessed One, Bhante, there are some ascetics and Brahmins who come to Kesaputta. They explain and elucidate their own doctrines, but they disparage, denigrate, deride, and denounce the other doctrines of others. But then some other ascetics and Brahmins come to Kesaputta. They too explain and elicit their own doctrines, but they disparage, denigrate, deride, and denounce the doctrines of others. We are perplexed and we are in doubt, Bhante, as to which of these good ascetics speak the truth and which ones speak falsehoods. It is fitting for you to be perplexed, Kalamas, it is fitting for you to be in doubt. Doubt has arisen in you about a perplexing matter. Come, Kalamas, and do not go by oral tradition, by lineage of teaching, by hearsay, by a collection of scriptures alone, by logical reasoning, by by being competence of a speaker or because you think 
the ascetic is our guru. But when Kalamas, you know for yourself, these things are unwholesome, these things are blameworthy, these things are centered by the wise, these things accepted and undertaken, they lead to harm and suffering. Then you should abandon them. What do you think, Kalamas? When greed arises in a person, is it for his welfare or for his harm? For his harm, Bhante. Kalamas. A greedy person overcome by greed with mind obsessed by it, destroys life, uses coarse and offensive speech gossips or slanders, and he encourages others to do likewise, will that lead to his harm and suffering for a long time? Yes, Bhante. What do you think, Kalamas? When hatred arises in a person, is it for the welfare or for his harm? For his harm, Bhante. Kalamas, a person who is full of hate, overcome by hatred, with a mind obsesses by it, destroys life, takes what is not freely given, transgresses with another's wife, speaks falsehoods, and uses coarse and offensive speech. gossips or slanders and encourages others to do likewise. Will that lead to his harm and suffering for a long time? Yes, Bhante. What do you think, Kalamas, when delusion arises in a person? Is it for his welfare or for his harm? For his harm, Bhante. Kalamas, a person who is deluded, overcome by delusion, with mind obsessed by it, destroys life, takes what is not freely given, transgresses with another's wife, speaks falsehoods, and uses coarse and offensive speech, gossips or slanders, and he encourages others to do likewise as well. Will that lead to his harm and suffering for a long time? Yes, Bhante. Now, what do you think, Kalamas? Are these things wholesome? Or unwholesome? Unwholesome, Bhante. Blameworthy or blameless? Blameworthy, Bhante. Censured or praised by the wise? Censured by the wise, Bhante. Accepted and undertaken? Do they lead to harm and suffering or not? Or how do you take it? Accepted and undertaken, Bhante. These things lead to harm and suffering. So we take it. Now come, Kalamas. Do not go by oral tradition, by lineage of teaching, by hearsay, by collection of scriptures, by logical reasoning, by inferential reasoning, by reasoned cogitation, by the acceptance of a view after pondering it, by seeming competence of a speaker, or because you think the ascetic is our guru. But when you know for yourselves these things are wholesome, these things are blameless, these things are practiced by the wise, these things, if accepted and undertaken, lead to the welfare and happiness, then you should live in accordance with them. What do you think, Kalamas? 
when non-greed arises in a person, is it for their welfare or for their harm? For his welfare, Bhante. And Kalamas, a person without greed, not overcome by greed, his mind is not obsessed by it, he does not destroy life, he does not take what is not given, does not transgress with another's mate, or speak falsehoods or use coarse and offensive speech, gossip or slander, nor does he encourage others to do likewise. Will this lead to his welfare and happiness for a long time? Yes, Bhante. What do you think, Kalamas? When non-hatred arises in a person, is it for his welfare? or for his harm, for his welfare, person out hatred, his mind not obsessed by it, he does not destroy life, does not take what is not given, transgress with another's mate, or speak falsehoods or use coarse and offensive speech, does not gossip or slander, nor does he encourage others to do likewise. Will this lead to his welfare and happiness for a long time? Yes, Bhante. And what do you think, Kalamas, when non-delusion arises in a person? Is it for his welfare or for his harm? for his welfare, Bhante. Kalamas, a person without delusion, not overcome by delusion, his mind, not obsessed by it, does not destroy life, take what is not given, transgress against another's mate, or speak falsehoods or use coarse and offensive speech, gossip or slander, nor does he encourage others to do likewise. Will this lead to his welfare and happiness for a long time? Yes, Bhante. What do you think, Kalamas? Are these things wholesome or unwholesome? Wholesome, Bhante. Blameworthy or blameless? They are blameless, Bhante censured or praised by the wise, praised by the wise, Bhante. Accepted and undertaken, do they lead to harm and suffering or not? Or how do you take it? Thus, Kalamas, when it is said, come Kalamas, do not go by oral tradition, do not go by lineage of teaching, by hearsay or by collection of scriptures, by logical reasoning, by inferential reasoning, by reasoned cogitation, by the acceptance of a view after pondering it, by the seeming confidence of a speaker alone, or because you think the ascetic is a guru. And when, Kalamas, you know for yourselves these things are wholesome, these things are blameless, these things are praised by the wise, these things, if accepted and undertaken, they lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Then you should live in accordance with them. And it is because of this that this was said. Now then, Kalamas, that noble disciple who is thus a devoid of longing, devoid of ill will, unconfused, clearly comprehending, ever mindful, dwells pervading one quarter with the mind imbued with loving kindness, and then imbued with compassion, and then imbued with empathetic joy, and then imbued with equanimity. Likewise to the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter, and this same practice then above below, across, and everywhere, and to all as him or herself, and dwells pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with equanimity, 
vast, exalted, measureless with enmity, without ill will. Now this disciple, Thomas, whose mind is in this way, without enmity, without ill will, undefiled and pure. He has won four solaces, comforts in this very life. The first solace they have won is this. If there is no other world and there is no fruit and result of good and bad deeds, it is possible that with the breakup of the body after death, I will be reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world. This is the first comfort. The second solace they have one is this. If there is no other world and there is no fruit and result of good and bad deeds, still right there in this very life, I maintain myself in happiness and without enmity and without ill will, free from troubles. Third solace they have one is this. Suppose that evil does come to one who does evil. Then when I have no evil intentions towards anyone, how can suffering afflict me since I do no evil deeds? And fourth solace they have one is this. Suppose evil does not come to anyone. Then right here I see for myself, I am purified in both respects. This noble disciple, Kalamas, whose mind is in this way, without enmity, without ill will, undefiled and pure, has won these four solaces within this very life. So it is, blessed one, so it is, fortunate one, this noble disciple whose mind is in this way, without enmity, without ill will, undefiled and pure, has won four assurances in this very life. The noble disciple, Bhante, whose mind is in this way, without enmity, without ill will, undefiled and pure, has won these four assurances in this very life. Magnificent Lord, magnificent, just as if he were to place upright what was overturned, to reveal what was hidden, to show the way to one who was lost, or to carry a lamp into the dark, so that those with eyes, without eyes, could see forms. In the same way has the Blessed One, through many lines of reasoning, he has made the Dhamma clear. We go to the Blessed One for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of monks. And may the Blessed One remember us as lay followers who have gone to him for refuge from this day forward for life. So this is the basic sutta. This is the basic way the Buddha is explaining this. Now, if we go back in the sutta and first look at a couple points, I don't know if everybody's caught some of the meaning. We go back into the sutta a minute before we can look we can look at the Pali. I also gave you a set of Pali that was researched before one year. And the, these Pali pieces take apart the individual pieces he's talking about. Let's go look at that first, okay? Maybe Doc, Doc, are you looking at this? Maybe you could pronounce it better than me. <laughs> I'm not always pronouncing this totally correctly, but let's see, I go back to the share. Um, Mm -hmm. Bring it up here. Okay. 
So when we get down here to the bottom, Anusawena, do not believe, this is what the sutta is about now, Anus, Anu, Ma, Anusawena. Do not believe something just because it has been passed along and retold for many generations. Do not be led by what you are told. This is the encouragement he gives them first and foremost. So he's not pushing them at all to just believe me because I'm the Buddha. He's not doing this. He's teaching them how to think for themselves. Next one, Ma Param Paraya. Do not believe something merely because it has become a traditional practice by people. Do not be led by whatever has been handed down from past generations simply because of that, you know. Another one, Ma Itikiraya. Do not believe something simply because simply because it is well known everywhere. Do not be led by hearsay or common opinion. The next one, Ma Pitika Sam Patanena. Do not believe something just because it is cited in text. Do not be led by what the scriptures say. Test everything. This part, this one piece, this goes back to uh, back to um, uh, this one goes back to the part that talks to us about the tradition of the way he was teaching by knowledge and vision first then growing knowledge and wisdom. The knowledge and wisdom comes after the knowledge and vision. And this can be hard sometimes because if we have one experience and we feel, well, now we're Sotapanna or Sotapanna and fruition or Sakanagami Saka, now we think we're ready. But if our teaching, if our comprehension of teaching is not in balance with our practice and we run away and try to teach very quickly, that we can get in trouble because we're not in balance. And this is something that we have to be careful about. The tendency when you have, when you are able to go through and have an experience is, well, now I've gone through and I know everything. <laughs> and that's not quite the same because the way these are steps, these attainments were steps. And he's talking about it in Majima Nikai number 107, he's saying, He's teaching people like a horse trainer teaches a horse from the time it's a young colt. And that was just gradually training and uh, gradual practice and gradual progress. So no matter what happens, we have it understood this far that we can go through once or twice with a fruition of, of the first attainment, but we are not there because our tendency is to want to to measure you by what happened to me. And that's difficult because that's not always right. All of a sudden you're sitting in front of 40 people with 40 different brains moving, 40 different, uh, different speeds of development. And their experience is not necessarily going to be the same as yours. And so it's difficult to get started with training sometimes when you're teaching. Um, Next one is, um, let's see, Ma Piti, I did that one, Pitika, um, testing everything. Ma Takahetu, do not believe something solely on the grounds of logical reasoning. Do not be led by mere logic, test it in practice. Ma Nayahetu, do not believe something merely because it accords with your own philosophy. Do not be led by it. mere deduction or inference. Test it. That's what he's saying is tested. And that's the state that when we hear this request, they're saying means test it. 
practice knowledge through vision, knowing something by seeing it. And we're giving you the practice where you can see it. That's what's so neat. Ma takahetu, okay, ma nayahetu. Do not believe something merely because it accords with your philosophy. You did that one. Akara parivitakena. Oh, let's see. Akara paravitakena. Do not believe something because it appeals to your common sense. Do not be led by considering only outward appearance. Next one. Ma diti nijana kantia. Do not believe something just because you like the idea. Do not be led by preconceived notions and the theory reflected as an approval. Ma bab barup bab bab barup takaya tataya. I'm sorry. Do not believe something because the speaker seems trustworthy. Do not be led by what seems acceptable. Do not be led by what is seemingly believable because one is saying it. Ma samana no garuti. Do not believe something thinking. This is what our teacher says. Do not be led by what your teacher tells you is so. So again, Kalamas, when you yourselves directly know, I have to go back here a minute. A minute. These things are wholesome, blameless, praised by the wise when adopted and carried out. They lead to well being, prosperity, and happiness then you shall accept them and practice them. You should. Go to Mabuddha Kesaputta Sutta in the fifth sutta, the sutra, the book of threes in the Mahavaga, in the gradual sayings, the Tika Nipata, that's where this came from. And then it has a statement that is below, that is all written in Pali. I'm not going to try to read through because I'm not that good at reading Pali to you. Okay, going back into the sutta itself, um, it's pretty, I broke this into pieces for you, where first the Kalamas are asking for the guidance to uh, how to know good teaching when it is presented. And then the Buddha then does a system. So he's first looking at the suffering they're going through, and then he's going to then give a criterion for rejection, how what is what should you be looking for and if it's not carried through if it is not making sense for you you know that's a basic thing if it is not making sense uh to you uh in life if it's not bringing forth support for you to be happy that's not necessarily that's not the right one to be be going for it's pretty clear okay anything that you don't understand, he's demonstrating greed, hatred, and delusion. Let's keep going a little bit here. He's, he's demonstrating greed, hatred, and delusion. We understand greed, hatred, delusion. What is that? Delusion is thinking everything is about me, it is mine, it is myself as it's happening and believing everything because of that. If you believe it's all me, it's me, I say, I, me, my, mine. If it's I, it's me, it's my, it's mine, okay. Or myself, you start to believe everything happening with the sixth sense doors is actually me, it is mine, it is myself. Is this false, this is what they're calling delusion, okay. And that gets you into trouble because you become so self-oriented, it's selfish. So when you go to the person with narcissistic problem, of everything's about me, me, me. And nobody can deal with them. You can't have relationships with them. There's no way to talk to them. They're right with everything. There is no, no back and forth discussion about anything. It becomes impossible for the person to have a relationship that'll work, that'll help them in life. Not just a personal relationship, but a relationship in a family, 
in the community, at work, or in having to do with the world, if they get caught in that spot. That's what the problem with the delusion was. And so we say taking everything personally is the problem. And then what he goes on, he goes on a little bit. The Buddha invites the Kalamas to review what they heard when he talked about that. And he explained it. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Now I'm getting really confused. <laughs> I love this. Um, help, I don't know how to get out of here. Here we go. Um, go back to view. Somewhere there's a view, let's see, view. Oh dear, hi, <laughs> I got a view of all of you. Okay, I cannot figure out how to get this into a view now. Um, nope, I can't go back. What's wrong? Help, Dama Gavesi, I'm stuck. We can see you, we can see you now. You can see me, okay. Be great. Uh, I'm still trying to get one page on the. I know how to do it. Wait, I know how to do it. Here. There. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Whoops. Now I lost you. How did I lose you? Um, here, now we're back. I'm sorry. Okay. Go back here. When you first were looking at greed, hatred, and delusion, and then he's on greed, non hatred, and non delusion. So now, what I want you guys to realize is that when he's talking about the good part, this is what's really neat. Non-greed, non, um, non-hate, this is, this is basically loving kindness and compassion. And non-delusion is taking things impersonally, is living anatta perspective. And so what he's talking about in this particular sutta is basically what we're showing you. Because we're teaching you guys, we are showing you guys uh, basically how to practice by using a practice where you are in an awareness and you can see things happening inside step by step with phenomena, but also outside living in life, you can tell when you're moving into craving and clinging. Your craving is basically the I like it, I don't like it mind, okay? And this is the turning into I want it and uh, I get attached to it or I don't like it and I have aversion to it and then I want to make it stop and I'm obsessing trying to make it stop, you see? And this is the wrong side where the right side is basically no matter what comes up, never mind, let it go by, let it live its life. And so each one of the pieces, each phenomena that arises in your life that you're experiencing as you go along, these are just like the lifetime of us, the lifetime of a phenomena. This is all the Buddha is talking about. The further in you go with your practice, the smaller things, this, it seems like everything's getting slowing down inside. Actually, your awareness and mindfulness is getting sharper and speeding up. I used to try to explain this by showing you on a whiteboard, there were two cars on a highway, two cars, and one car is here and it's going by, it's going like, say, 60 miles an hour. Well, say it's going 50 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour like this, and the other car comes and this is the one car is here and this is the other car. The, this one's going 50 and this one's going 70 and it goes, it can't see anything. It can't see anything inside. It's not there long enough to see anybody in the car, to see what they're wearing, to see what they look like. You can even see a person's, it's remarkable if we're both going 50 miles an hour next to each other on a highway 
and we're just going along, you know, fifth, both side by side. I can look in and see, see your tie. <laughs> I can see there's a horse on your tie or the print on your shirt. You couldn't go that fast. I'm not sure what this is. Okay. You couldn't you couldn't go that fast on the highway, but at 50 miles an hour, if you were going side by side, they were talking to the kids in the other car and the father driving his car. We were having fun. This is a two two lanes. Nobody else is around. No other cars, and it's on this uh, country highway. And the other highway is there's trees between us and them. There's nobody there but us. And the two cars are going along at 50 miles an hour. Looking over, I could see the kids. My kids could talk to them. They could talk to my kids. They could pass the ball back and forth if they wanted to with each other at 50 miles an hour, because we're at a match speed just going along the road. Well, you think about your brain. How can you see these things we're talking about? How can you tell me that you can actually watch consciousnesses arising? What's happening? And I talked to a neurologist and I said, is our brain slowing down? And he said, the brain's not firing slower, okay? But when you don't have anything going on in your head, in your head, uh, no thoughts, worries, stresses, and you've let go of everything in the past, everything in the future, and you're right here, then your observation is speeding up. Your observation power is getting stronger. It's like if you're still enough and you're quiet enough, Maybe I'll turn it up to another lens power with the electron microscope so you can see even deeper what's happening, you see? So in trying to explain to people what they'll say, what are you doing? What is so fun about this? What is, it's fun because I should maybe have stayed a scientist. <laughs> I really had fun when they gave me the first microscope in high school. There were three little lenses on it and one of them could show you this was pond water and something's in there. Don't drink it, <laughs> it's pond water. And the second one, you could see little amoebas moving. You could see somebody's living in there. <gasps> somebody's living in the water. <laughs> this is really exciting. And then you could get to the third one and we had four of them. And I think you get to the third one, you can see there's two little, three little, oh, there's five little ones in there like this. Five little guys are in the pond water. And then you get to the next lens and you look inside and you can see inside one of them is inside like inside your body this is getting really exciting i don't know how kids can get past the science class it was so exciting you know um gosh okay and then people talk about electron microscopes what they can see and examine mitosis and the splitting of the cells inside of the little pieces inside the amoebas and we're getting smaller 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 then they're looking at blood and what do they find coronavirus <laughs> oh my gosh and they can tell you what it looks like this is amazing i just think it's amazing so what are we doing what are we really doing we are looking inside. We are looking inside what? We're looking inside our mind. Nobody knows where mind is in consciousness, but we're going to say it's in your head somewhere up here. It's in this thing, you know, it's in our head somewhere. Okay, we don't have to pin it down. The important thing is what's happening is that when you sit and you get very, very quiet, you must have a balanced level of concentration because the, if it's balanced, what is balanced concentration? Balanced concentration is productive concentration. Ah, what is productive concentration? The Buddha said that productive concentration or good, con good meditation was meditation that was able to go down the path. And you understand where you're going 
you're not just driving without a map from the AAA, <laughs> you know, if we call the AAA in the United States. You go on a trip and you send away and they send you a whole booklet about where you're going with all the maps and tell you how to get there. The Buddha left this information for us. It's right there. If you go read 137, read 137 very carefully. Majima Nikai number 137 is like a map. When you go and look in that, that particular one, it is like a map. You do you have a description of the route you're going to take yep that one is 111 then 111 is about the uh the anupada sutta that we teach you in the retreats we try to show you where it is that you go along now you have to be careful aren't you supposed to be careful of joy she shouldn't get stuck on joy somebody will say that you shouldn't be stuck on feeling happy goodness don't get stuck on that <laughs> but you get don't stay there too long there's nothing wrong with being happy he's telling you right here in this sutta that we just talked about he's really saying all you have to do to get to heaven is be good that's all it's saying and then he's giving you a framework of five five precepts for the lay person and all he's saying to you all out there is be good. Anybody seen E.T., <laughs> the movie E.T.? Be good. That's what he said to the little girl before he left. Be good. <laughs> no, if you just be good, this isn't that hard. You can have a good life here. You be kind. Look at the guidance of the five precepts. This is not space map. You don't kill other living beings. Why? Because do you want to get killed? Do you think the dog wants to get killed? Or the cat? Or even the turtle? Do you think they want to get killed? Look at the birds. Have you ever seen what happens with a bird when uh, an animal kills one of the babies and the bird is on the ground? The mother doesn't just leave. Have you ever taken a look at the animals? What happens to the elephants if a baby elephant dies? I'll send you a picture. They have a whole routine. They carry the body for miles to get in a whole line, the, the body of the baby elephant that's been killed until they can get it to the burial ground and leave it there. And then they go on with their life. They're amazing. There's more intelligence around than we think. You know, we like to think we're at the top of the chain, but from the looks of the earth, I have my questions, <laughs> okay? And it, you know, it when you look at animals in this way, I this is one thing about that, you see. So don't steal. Do you want somebody to steal from you? If somebody steals from you, how are you gonna feel? If you're living in a group, don't steal. Don't take what is not freely given. Why do we say that? I'll tell you why. Because when the war in Afghanistan starts uh, in, uh, yeah, in, in uh, Iraq, no, Afghanistan. When the war in Afghanistan was going on, things were happening and they were showing up in California for sale. And people's houses were stripped and doors, ancient doors and walls and decorations and things like that. You know perfectly well the people that were in those houses didn't give permission for those places to be torn apart and, and sent back. And, into antique shops and stuff like that. It was really sad what was happening. The stuff we were finding in the antique shops at the beach was in California, when Bonte and I were out there talk, you know, going to do retreats in different places, we would take walks sometimes in the little towns into antique shops had things they shouldn't have. And it was clear and we could feel the energy. So when we say do not take something that is not freely given, that's what we mean. It's not just sneaking in a house and stealing it, or they leave it so you just don't return it. It's making sure you have permission to have it when it's given like that. The third one is don't have wrong sexuality. And wrong sexuality, what a broad topic this is. And it should not be a broad topic. 
because this topic was very well defined. And there are some suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, you will run into it. I can't, this one's not on the top of my mind, but there's a few different places where when they start to talk about the precepts, they are really completely defined. And this, this particular precept, okay, not to have wrong sexuality is very well defined, okay? You do not have sex without having consent with the other partner. That's number one. So if the person, the two people don't want to do this, don't do it. You're only going to get, cause a lot of trouble, have a lot of anguish and everything afterwards. Um, the next one is do not have sex with somebody who is still living with their parents. Don't do that. <laughs> it's really a bad situation and you don't know what's going to happen. And the, you know, this is a problem, even if you ended up marrying the person, uh, don't do it without consent that is tied into this whole thing. You see, it's very important. The other one is with children that are, uh, we said children living too young who are still living with their parents. That's the one, and then permission parents. So the bottom line, when I'm looking at all the breakdown, there's about five different pieces to that one, actually, not one. When you look at all five, where does it go? It goes to do not do anything that causes mental or physical pain to anyone. And that means not just the two people, but the surrounding people in the families. If you're causing pain and anguish to the family members, don't be doing that because if you're gonna to stay together, especially have some thoughts about if you're gonna to stay together, What's going to happen with family relationships for the rest of your life? Okay, and then the the next one is uh, to um, do not. Um, oh, what's the next one? <laughs> the third one is the third one. The next one was not to. Um, what's the what's the fourth speech. one? Speech. Pause but, speech. Speech, and speech is a tricky one because speech. Um, do not use wrong speech. So. We know, don't tell lies, right? Okay, so they like to say, I had someone call me from Canada once. I was in, um, I was in Virginia, I think. No, Mass I guess in Missouri. And they, and they called me on the phone and they said, why are you telling people about gossip and slander and all of this stuff? This is just don't tell lies. And I'm there, well, see, this is the, like the one about sex, having sex, sexual activity lies covers a lot of ground okay so you don't tell lies that's going to end up in a problem for you carrying around the kickback of the karma the kamapala the fruit of that action is going to make you uptight wondering if anybody knew about it you're going to be walking around do they know do they know who knows about what i i said that's part of it okay um so it's a problem for you and the people around you. So don't tell lies. Don't gossip. The gossip one is really bad. And the gossip one, it tears people apart, destroys offices, destroys uh, corporate office structures and sales teams. I've seen it do a lot of things. I worked in com employment consulting work and I heard a lot of problems. Why people had to leave, you had to get another person, what happened? They tell me all kinds of things, and this is bad news. This is very bad news, okay? So you don't want to get involved in that kind of thing with gossip. Slander in the corporate world is rampant. And the reason people don't even know what the word means anymore, it's a fascinating thing to see that happen, slander, and watch it happening and realize, I realize neither of the people involved, they even know what the word slander meant. Slander is used to get the position for the, for the, uh, the better position than you have to get the better position. Uh, not have the other person get it, but you get it. And so you start a story about that other person so that person can't have it. So it's a form of starting the, the beginning of gossip and the gossip feeds the whole thing all around, you see. And it's a huge mess, 
huge mess that hurts both people. Lots of times the two people involved in a slander situation both end up getting fired. That's another thing that can happen because the corporation sees what's going on and they don't want that kind of person. They don't want them, okay? And then um, the, uh, the last one uh, is, um, you know, using yeah. foul language and harsh, 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 harsh language and everything is the fourth part of that one. Okay. And then the fifth, the fifth one is, is, is really necessary. Now, you know, I'm going to tell you something very frank, you know, I was a professional singer for a number of years and I sang in concerts and I sang in all different kinds of venues and churches and everything. And, you know, I, I'm not someone who drinks at all. I've never been somebody who drinks, but people want to buy you a drink or something. It's crazy. You, what you, if you, if you're really afraid of the appearance of this whole thing and you're a salesperson and everybody else is, why can't I, if I don't, nobody will like me. This is what goes on in your head. Then you walk up to the bartender and just tell them straight out. I want seven up and an olive all night long. That's it. Don't drink. It's just crummy. And you'll, after a while, when you're not drinking at all, I promise you one thing, you will sit there and start observing people who are drinking. And after a while, you're gonna wanna find somebody else in there who has seven up and an olive and the two of you are gonna go sit and talk about things or talk about the world in an intelligent way. People go nuts. They go crazy when they start drinking. There's, it's really sad. And um, the, the way out of the situation is simply not to be around it at all, not. But if you're in a position in business today, it's very difficult for that to be happening in, in international companies and stuff that you're never going to be asked to, uh, you know, to drink. But don't ever be afraid to not drink. Just simply have something else. There are Shirley Temples, there are Seven Ups and Olives, there are all kinds of things. There are just uh, virgin this and virgin that, orange juice and pineapple juice and everything. Just have a good time, but stay completely right in the head. That's all I can advise you. I'm not gonna advise you to run away and quit your job, but we have to be less sensitive, uh, more sensitive to ourselves and what's really right and keep our brains and our minds really out there and clear with everything. Now, did you understand what he's talking about? Did you understand what he was talking about um, concerning, something is wrong here. Let's see, what's wrong? Hold on a second. For the, for the actual sutta, I wanna be sure that you understand. Oh boy. Oh gosh, what happened? Okay. Please unmute. I, I, I okay. muted you because okay. it was. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to do that, but I had a we we've had contractors here, and so I'm trying to keep up with all of this. And he unplugged it. I thought he plugged it back in. <laughs> so tell me what you think of this. You have four things that are happening here that he's basically um, I'm screen sharing. Huh? How do I do this? I want to know if you understand what he was saying to these people that they really do have a chance. You want to stop screen sharing? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Stop no, screen sharing. I wanted to go back to what it was that he was offering, but how do I downsize you guys? I'm confused what I'm doing, which is not new. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you do this? <laughs> I love this. I'm never gonna, you know, if I'm reborn and I have to come back, I wanna come back to horses and wagons. <laughs> I said that to somebody the other day. I shouldn't say that, but all right. Uh, Let's see. How do you get back to the screen sharing? 
Dama Givesi. You are at the screen sharing, uh, so maybe. I am, I am, I am, okay. I know how to do it. Whoops, wait a minute. Okay, I got it. Okay, what I was curious about is whether you understand the four pieces that he's saying everybody can have. And this is whether you're Buddhist or not, it doesn't have anything to do with that, anything. It's saying there are four solaces, there are three, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if who you are, you know, this is true about life. If there is no other world, just suppose there is no other world and there's no fruit or result of good or bad action and deeds, which some people believe that. And it is possible that with the breakup of the body after death, I will be reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world. It is possible that that's true. If you are living the way this is described in the sutta, where you're following the precepts and you're respectful of other people and they're respectful of you, that is an outcome that could happen for anyone. He's being honest about it. The second solace, if there is no other world and there is no fruit or result of the good or bad deeds, then this right here in this very life, I maintain myself in happiness without enmity, meaning without thinking badly of other people or um, hating them or anything, without ill will towards them, doing anything cruel to them and free from trouble in this life, I will be free from trouble. So he's being honest. And then the third one, suppose evil comes to one who does evil, then I have no evil intentions towards anyone. How can suffering afflict me? Since I do not, do, I do no evil deed. So you don't have to worry about it. something is going to in, in come down on you as long as you are not doing evil deeds. And he's being honest about that. And the fourth one is that uh, suppose an evil does not come so he's being really fair he's really presenting this in a way where where he's trying to show what will happen if you have a good you're good and we come back to this little booklet i don't have it here i still have one i just haven't unpacked my books yet okay but there's a little booklet case you dominate wrote and he said, if you want to go to heaven, be good. That's what he said. Be good to yourself and to other people and the people around you, and that will come back to you and you'll discover it. That's what he explains in the book. So the one thing about the Buddha that was different from many um, other faiths or religions, the Buddha does not proselytize. He does not proselytize. I do not teach you to proselytize. I simply try to guide you to understand what this is. So the, the word that the Buddhist uses is promulgation. To promulgate is a dedication to presenting the information to people to consider, but and making sure it doesn't disappear and hoping that they can see themselves and you can guide them to help them to see, but you can't push them or you don't recruit them. Yeah, that's what it was like when he first started. That's what it was like. Now today, as things are changing in the timeline, we see the effort some places where people actually have said to me, um, how many Buddhists did you make? Well, I have to announce something to you. In this past year with the seven retreats that we did, it's been 14 years that I've been a nun and I've been teaching for about 11 or 12 of those years. I've been teaching pretty seriously. And this, this last time I did bring one person to become a Buddhist officially in the temple up in the Himalayas, okay? That asked me to go and get the monk that was there I asked him to help me and the two of us went to the temple by ourselves and 
she wished to completely take the refuges to become a Buddhist. And that was special, you know, that was a very special time for that to happen. She sincerely wanted to do that. And that's great. But in 14 years, I've never persuaded anybody to, to, to become a Buddhist. And I'm sure maybe some people went further. I know they did in their studies. And maybe, and some of them went to get into ropes. I know that happened. But that's not what I'm about. I'm a guide. And we're, we're only, we, we shy away from guru or teacher or master and this kind of thing because he gave those monks something to carry out and what they were supposed to do was to protect it. And they were supposed to keep it going so that those who could see would be able to see. That's the last line of this, uh, of this particular um, sutta is, um, is something that you see a lot of times. Let me see if I can find out, get back there. Can I? Yeah, the very last lines it closes off many of the suttas, they end this way. You, and this is not unusual to see this at the end of it. Magnificent Lord, magnificent, just as if he were to place upright what was overturned, to reveal what was hidden, to show the way to one who was lost, or to carry a lamp, into the dark so that those with eyes could see forms. In the same way, the Blessed One, through many lines of reasoning, has made the Dhamma clear. And that's all it is. That's what we're doing. So any feedback from you guys? Because that's it. That's all I have for you tonight. I'm short. <laughs> I'm short tonight. <laughs> what? Do you have any questions? about this hmm? really <laughs> did you like the sutta did you yeah it's, um, i see you it's a, yeah, yeah i'm sorry yeah. who's there i always start because everybody's very quiet so. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right um I mean, I, I think that um, there, there, are many, there are many layers to this, but the one that becomes very obvious to me is the, um, you know, the, the, the right speech versus wrong speech in, in, in this sutta as well. I mean, it's, um, it, the, there are so many conflicts that are going on in the world. They have always been there because people just sort of like are attached to whatever they believe, whatever they think, and they want everybody to believe the same thing. You know, and the whole thing is about how you, how you can say about the fray, it seems to me, you know, with all that. Um, so that's, that's, that's what, mm. what, I, what was clear to me, you know, it's so much about right speech, so much that goes wrong is because the things that we don't stop and think and say, you see what I mean? Yes, I do, I do. Um, the thing about right speech, uh, we have an unstable connection here. Let's see if we can keep it going a little longer. The, the speech that people do, you express yourselves in so many different ways. Um, I never in a million years would have thought that I would do what I'm doing as a nun because my real way of speaking had always been in music, you see, had always been there. I wasn't one to philosophize or to get into philosophy um, in, or, or be outspoken very much at all. But music was the way to reach people and to speak to them. And that was why I was doing the music, not to be glorified or be famous or anything like that. I was doing it to see if they could move somewhere outside of where they were when they came to listen because when they came to listen, many of them were way down low. And when they left, they were really much higher and happier. And that was my way of communicating, you see? We communicate with our body language all the time. People forget about that. This is the, why, the reason we don't wanna say right speech alone, but right communication or harmonious communication is what we really need to happen because we can, communicate with people and calm them down 
just by expressions and by our overall body movements and motions and direction of, of what we're doing with movement is a form of communication. So do we nail it down to just right speech? And I don't know how it really happened, except uh, when, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, when you grew up, look back in your mind and tell me if your mother did not have <clears throat> the voice. <laughs> And if you were doing something naughty, she could come to the door and simply go, Ulysses. <laughs> and that was it. He knew he was in trouble coming in the house right away. <laughs> that, you know, and I remember this. And then I see people with large families, they tell me, oh yes. And the mother also has this famous position of like this with the arm on the hip. And if they're standing in the door with their head tilted down with her arm on the hip, you'd better come in and stop playing ball because the next level is not good. So we have all these different ways as human beings uh, to express ourselves. And um, a lot of that has deteriorated in society, I think. We don't see it as clearly. So looking only at speech is not quite the whole story, is it? Hmm? Perel, yeah, you're you're on mute, Perel, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for the reading this sutta to us. It was um, I I really like the sutta, and some one thing that really struck me in this sutta is that keeping the five precepts or uh, not keeping the five precepts can arise from ill will. It can arise from greed. And it can arise from delusion, either one of them or all of them. And that was uh, quite eye-opening, you know, I felt. The way he has put it, uh, the way Buddha has put it in explaining to the Kalamans, that uh, each of these can, uh, can give, you know, if we don't keep our precepts, it could be because of any of these three main uh, um, afflictions. I liked that a lot too. I did. I liked that a lot too. And I also liked, did you catch the part where, you know, uh, he points out sending loving kindness in this direction, you see, and then he's, you're listening to our instructions is what you're listening to, how we're teaching you to, to do the loving kindness in front of you, behind you, to the around, to the right of you, to the left of you, above and below. And it's right there. It's right there. So, and, it, and he's saying, basically, I'm not telling you to do this just sometimes. I'm telling you to carry it with you and to be doing it in front of you, to the people around you, to the people behind you and above and below, if you're in a double bus, <laughs> above and below all around you all the time. And if you're carrying it all the time, what is so important about this? What is so important is that we're teaching you how to detect craving arising and craving is the cause of your suffering. And ignorance is part of it, yes, but once we explain how it works and you have the information, it doesn't mean you're gonna automatically remember it all the time. Okay, but when you have that, once you're given that information, we have relieved you of a lot of the ignorance. Now you have the knowledge, but now there's all kinds of levels. You had it not at all, then you had it from here when you first heard it, closer, closer, closer inside you, into your heart, into your body, and starts to function. If you have the proper practice, like we hope this is the practice, you are reducing the stress and the tension and the tightness all the time. So you get to detect sooner and sooner the arising of the craving because the craving always arises with tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. 
So the, the piece that connects all this is when you are reducing it all the time, then when it comes up, you can catch it here. But the person who isn't reducing it, is it not doing the relaxed step? They're not doing that relaxed step. Then when they're pulled away and they just come back and keep going and they can do this for years and years and years and not ever be able to see what we're seeing and what we're learning. And they think we're crazy. They think we're crazy. Uh, the people who say that uh, 111, for instance, in saying that that sutta is not real, it is not part of the EBTs, it's not authentic. The people who are saying that, remember who's speaking. They're people who are doing one point of concentration to absorption. They're trying very, very, very hard and putting pressure on their practice here and in the head. So when that person says they can't detect it until it's upon them, I believe them, that's correct. And when they say something like, it would take five or six years or more to get to the first jhana, I believe them, that's correct. Because the conditions that need to arise to fall into the first jhana cannot happen unless you're letting go, letting go, letting go, because that, that condition is somewhere down here. You have to be letting go, letting go and teaching your mind. And then all of this is like a little game, isn't it? And it's like a carryover when you were kids, you know, learning how to do something. Your mother didn't want you to do something. You had to learn to do something else. And she's constantly saying, don't do that anymore. I went back with one person. I went back to the child that comes to the table and sits there and goes, for dinner time and the grandma is put your hand in your lap you can't do that at the table and <laughs> i said put your hand in your lap and very sweetly she keeps saying put your hand in your lap you know after a month or so they're not putting their hand up there anymore nobody had to get spanked or yelled at or screamed at it was just a systematic putting your hand in the lap putting your hand in the lap finally the brain said we're at the table put the hand in the lap that was it <laughs> This was a great thing. I was staying at this house and they had all these kids and the one child was doing this, you know? And after a little while, you know, it was simple. We got to the point where the brain knew, put your hand in the lap. And that was the end of it. That's called a new neural pathway in the brain. And when we get to the table, we fold our hands and we wait for the food to come then, you know, and I thought, gee, why didn't I think about that with one of my kids that used to love to throw mashed potatoes? <laughs> you know, and I would wait until we never, we like to see him play with the mashed potatoes. We didn't want to stop them, but then they started throwing it at the older sister. <laughs> yeah, well, can't win them all. But this is just, this doesn't change when you're older. This is what is priceless in this research about being able to change a habit is not reserved for young children. Of course they can do it faster. Why wouldn't they be able to do it faster? They're empty, <laughs> you know, this is empty, you know? And then Perel doesn't get to see us until it's full, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Isn't that true, Dr. Perel? <laughs> you know, the, 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 the psychoanalysts, they don't get to see us until we go and say, oh my gosh, what's in here? This is why I've told you a couple of times, people come and they ask me all the time, what can I share with my friends? What can I do to help them? That it, they're not Buddhist, how can I help them? And I say, look, I have given you that lesson so many times and I'm telling you the truth. When I was in Malaysia, this is a Muslim country, basically. I it has everybody's there. Believe me, everybody's there. But you get an attack. I give this lesson all the time to taxi drivers. They were Buddhist. They were Hindu. They were Muslim. They were Christian. They were Jews. You know. And if they're upset, and I'm in the cab, and they're driving, they're going to get the same lesson. And it always has the same effect. This lesson has the same effect. We're going to do it one more time. We're going to do it right here. Let's do a whiteboard right now, right? This is the one you can teach anybody. Absolutely anybody, okay? Um, 
you you have a line like this. This is your life, your life continuum line. That's what this is. I need my little pencil. I'm doing it by hand, right? You know, okay. This is the life, life continuum, continuum line. You're born here. Everybody's born there. Everybody dies here. Okay, and you're moving along this line, obviously in this direction, right? Okay, and you are here or, or wherever you are. You could be older up here. You could be younger back there. Everything that is behind you is called the past and everything in front of you is called the future. And then, you know, you have to say, to, you have to ask the person what is true about the past? It's over. They'll say to you, it's over. It's fixed in time, fixed in time. Can I change it? No, you can't change it. You can't change it. Can I color it a different color? No, no different color. No different color because it's, it's can, I, can I mold it? No, you can't mold it. You can't mold like it differently, different. It's fixed. It's fixed in time. Okay, that's the thing about the past, fixed in time. Okay, now here's the future. What is true about the future? Do you know what it is? No, no, well, no, <laughs> no. Well, can you tell me, can you tell me which, which future it is gonna be? No, it could be, it could be anything. It could be anything. We don't know, we don't know, do we? We're not there yet, we're not there yet, okay? What is this? Where am I? You are here. Here you are. What is that? Present time. Present time is priceless. Present time um, can affect, it can affect the future. What you do in the present time dictates what happens in the future, but actually the future, remember, the future is like a hand with, with five fingers and five more light on top of it. You don't know what the future is. This is your hand, if that was your hand. Um, you know, <laughs> you don't know where you're going, all right? So then you ask, that. that's the first part of it. Once you see this, the present time is where you are right now, okay? And the problem with suffering is, is this. You have to draw a little picture like that. You draw a picture and the picture has energy in it. What you wanna be sure that when you fill this picture with water, okay, with water, you wanna be sure you don't give one third to the past and one third to the future and you only have one third left for your day. That's what you want to be sure of. You want to be sure that you don't take any of the past, don't take any of the past. If this is your little car, right? Here's your car. You don't want to put any of the past into that trunk and carry it with you when you drive away. You don't want to do that. You want to only use your daily energy for one thing, use your energy for today and you're in charge. And then, you know, the different religions, they're fine. They all have this story. It turns out most of them, most of them have this story, but you know what? They don't share it. They don't talk about it beyond when you're a little child. I remember this story. They said the past is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. And the present is called the present because look, it's wrapped up with a bow and it's really neat because it's here right now and here right now. And you wanna be where the present is so you stay in the present time. But you see how that lesson is universal? 
that's a universal lesson, but that lesson has three or four different sutras. It has four sutras. When you go to 131, you go to 131, 32, 33, and 34. They're all the same lesson. They have the same, the, the same exact poem in the in each one of them is actually the same in each one. Okay. So this is the end of it right now. I'm going to tell you right now. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been breached. Instead, with sight, let it see each presently arisen state in your mind. Let him know that and be sure of it invincibly and unshakably. Okay. That's what you need to do. And then it goes on, of course. <laughs> Today, <laughs> the effort <laughs> must <laughs> be made <laughs> to watch how these emails <laughs> work. Watch how these things are happening in your mind and understand because the effort must be made tomorrow death may come, who knows? No bargain with mentality can keep him and his hordes away. So one who dwells ardently, relentlessly by day and by night this is not something we're just teaching you and you do it at a retreat and leave it. Oh. Something you do all the time. It is he, the pace, the peaceful sage, who has said that he will have the excellent night. He'll sleep okay. well. He's only got the past gone and the future, let it go. And he's in the present. Gotcha. And when you go to sleep, you really will sleep. So that's it. That's all I can say. Uh, uh, Bhante, Bhante, are you there? I don't know where Bhante is. Bhante's off. <laughs> he's the, he's okay. taking care of everything, believe me. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> this happens. So I want to thank everybody who made donations to help us with this with the kuti. And I want to say the prayer so that you can go to the next stop. I think some of you are going to the next stop. All right, so wow. let's all fold our hands and we will um, okay. ring the bell, yeah. yeah? May suffering right. ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.